I am legitimately, I think I didn't realize it, but I have like some sort of weird Linux fest sleep hangover it happens every year, but I sat down and, uh, I actually forgot to even get in the mumble room. <laughs> have we ever even done the show without a mumble room? No, does it make sense? Even? <laughs> it's Linux <laughs> unplugged. <laughs> you got half the mumble rooms here. That is probably what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> both, both of you guys are here. Um, and so that is, a, that's a good portion at least, but, uh, sounds like, sounds like Wes has a pick me up before we get started. Oh yes. Well, okay. We have both been watching the very same show and you've reached Something of an important juncture. In oh, that really? Show. So I just thought you're going to be done soon. It's always hard when you finish a show. You know, it's all it's all over. You miss the characters. Here we go. I got you something to remember. It by. Oh, okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> no, <laughs> no. It's all the it's songs. A, it's a CD of Vic Fontaine from D Space Nine. Absolutely. The single-handedly nice. worst <laughs> thing about D Space Nine now on his own <laughs> CD. Oh, the only the only thing that's going to make this better is you know I'm going to put this in the car and put this on when I'm in with Hadia <laughs> and see how long it takes her to notice. <laughs> I would think we maybe we could rip it and uh, get some soundboard clips. I can't believe you yeah. found this. I can't believe it. Are, are any of the songs from the show on here? Yeah, that, they're all songs from the show. Oh, yeah. Saturn Doll, I'll Be Seeing You. Oh, wow. I'm getting angry just thinking about it. I'm getting there. There you go. I feel much better now. Thank you, Wes. the show. <laughs> this is Linux Unplugged, episode 299 for April 30th, 2019. Hello there, and welcome to your weekly Linux talk show that's just made it back from a huge Linux Fest Northwest. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello, Mr. Payne. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm alive, I think, but barely. Did you get some rest? A little bit. I, think, <laughs> I mean, I, I approached a full night's sleep, but it's about the only one in the past week. I'm yeah. sure you're even worse. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but we did walk away with some great stories, so we'll talk about those today. And we've got some great friends joining us in studio. Some of uh, some of them that have hung around from the fest, thankfully, actually, to make it on the show. So we'll get to all of that, you know, in this week's podcast, in this little here show. Ooh, coming right up. Lots to talk about, too. Plus, towards the end of the show, a brand new segment. Something we're rolling out. Something that afflicts all of us. Premiered today. First time. First time. Right here on the show. So uh, we'll get to that in just a bit. But before we go any further, got to bring in that virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings. Mumble room. Hello there. Hello. 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 Hello, Brandon, Bruce, Code Sections, Jeff, Mini, Mech. Well, uh, remember Sony? Six? I can't see. Remembers that. only. Oh, rem- oh, remembers only. Right, of course. Tech Mav and Turth are in there as well. But on the studio line, we have the one, the only Mr. Cheese Bacon. Hello, Cheese. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, man. How you doing? Doing great. Good, good, good. Well, nobody cares because we have something very important. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love am, you too. I am very excited to welcome Brent back in studio. It's been a while, Brent. Hello. Hello. Almost exactly a year. Yeah. It's tradition now. Mm-hmm. It's tradition. Gotta keep it going. And joining us in the studio for the first time, Mr. Ironic Badger, it's Alex. Hello, Alex. Good day. Pip, pip. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. Yes. Nice to have you for an extended time in the Pacific Northwest. And it sounds like he's falling in love. I, it's beautiful. I, I know. I think you should move up here, dude. Yeah, one day. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a lot to talk about today. Not just Linux Fest, but we have some really, really big news to start out with. Fedora 30 is out right now as we record, and we're taking a look at the Fedora 30 workstation, which ships with GNOME 3.32, completely refreshed icon themes, new consistency across the desktop, way snappier performance, the new application panel, the controlled permissions for flat packs, and a lot more. Of course, there's also the silver blue release and the cloud edition release, but I, regrettably, because of all the Linux Fest stuff, did not quite get this installed before the show. Wanted to take Elle out to lunch before she had to fly oh, that's out. That's nice of I you. I know. Did you get a chance to give it a look? Mm-hmm. You know, it took a while. I think their uh, CDNs are pretty popular. A lot of people <laughs> downloading this release, which is a good sign. Yeah, I got it installed in a virtual machine and uh, booted into the live CD. And it's, I mean, it's nice. Every, every time Fedora comes out, it's always a little hard because... It's not, a, it's not a radical change, right? It's a small iterative improvement, but I've been looking forward to their release of GNOME 3.32 because I've been enjoying it so much in 19.04. And that flicker-free boot, ooh, it's shiny. Oh, man, we've been looking forward to that for a while. Uh-huh. Okay. I mean, it's honestly, I hardly ever reboot my computer except for like a, a kernel upgrade. So I don't see it a lot. It's not something I really care about. But as someone who grew up 
some of the first hacking I did on a computer, you know, a wee little lad breaking my windows, my parents' windows workstation was changing how the boot screen appeared. And finally, Linux users get first class, decent looking boot. Now you need uh, flicker free uh, kegs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> I someday. Tease. I tease. There's uh, there's numerous improvements throughout Fedora and GNOME 3.3.2. It's pretty much worth it just for that update alone, but uh, I'll give you more thoughts later on as I get a chance to kick the tires. Congratulations to the team, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do a little comparison and performance. Did you have any early impressions between the Ubuntu 19.04 implementation of Gnome Shell and the Fedora 31? I mean, there's always a little, you know, they don't have the Ubuntu style theme, but otherwise, performance-wise, they both just felt really snappy. It's always nice to have a fresh Fedora installed with good classic GNOME. I didn't do any tweaking, so it wasn't, I would say, it doesn't come out of the box quite as pretty as 1904, but, you know, you can style it to your taste. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And some people do prefer the more standard-looking GNOME. And it's perfectly usable, you know what I mean? Like, you may not like the default theme, but it it works just fine. Sure, sure. Sure. Alex, I'm curious, did you hear any of the uh, purism scuttlebutt while we were at Linux Fest Northwest? I had some things I'm not sure I'm allowed to repeat. Oh, I'm going to repeat them. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, I wasn't going to, necessarily, uh, but then we have a pretty big announcement today from purism. And uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but um, mm-hmm. it is the era of services, and uh, they have launched the Librem 1, a, quote, growing bundle of ethical servers, uh, services. They have 530 out of 5,000 backers. Yes, this is another crowdfunder from Purism. This one now for services. And it includes a range of apps, Librem Chat, Librem Social, Librem Mail, and Librem Tunnel. Uh, Chat is an end-to-end encrypted VoIP chat using Matrix. Librem Mail is um, a rebadged mail client. I understand Librem Tunnel is, I think, private internet access white label and Librem Social, I think is also a rebadge of Mastodon and things like that. But it's it's self hosted, private labeled, privacy first focused. Right. As they say, no ads, no tracking, and quote, we respect you. Have you seen how many options there are on these packages? It's quite a bit, yeah. There must be fifteen, twenty different options here. What do you think of the pricing? So like the basic pricing is Yeah, so you described it as a as like a crowdfunding thing. But generally, I think of a crowdfunding program as something you pay up front, like, a, you know, you pay one right. cost. Here, though, they're all talking, they say, like, the full monthly bundle, seven ninety nine a month. They also have a couple of weird ones, like a $20 one-time or $5 monthly donation. So there's, like, different options where you can just, and they, the way they write it is, uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, Purism is a social purpose company. If you'd like to donate to the cause of social good and technology and want to see more products and services from Purism, well, we welcome it. So just send us some money. But at, th- at this point, it's going to be cheaper in the long run to invest in your own self-hosted thing, is it not? And just as privacy focused. I, I do think it's an interesting space to explore because we're all all right. I mean, right, people people that use Dropbox or other things. There are many managed services that we like to use. We we have complaints about their, the privacy of the implementation and what's going on behind the scenes. And I've been I've kind of wondered, why don't we see more of this you know, taking the open source software that we can run for ourselves and okay. not really developing it anymore. Maybe they're they're adding back to it, but just running it for you. Compare a DigitalOcean droplet at five dollars a month running Nextcloud with this service for eight dollars a month. You know, you look at the, the feature list here. You know, um, VPNs, documents, mail, all the rest of it, and there's pretty much nothing you can't self-host yourself for five dollars a month. That they're offering here for eight. Absolutely. But, but for $3 yeah. more. So like I pay, I think like $2 a month for someone to host my mail server. Not that I couldn't, I just don't want to. And yeah, I think mail's exactly. on the on the other end of that spectrum. Mail, like, I would agree because yeah. of the whole spam thing. But everything else, like Nextcloud is so good now. That's true. Especially with the with the Snap version that they have. It is easy to install. I just wonder, I mean, if, are there people who like the philosophy but don't have an admin experience or just don't have the time to, to want to bother with a digital ocean droplet. Yeah, I think there is likely uh, a customer base for this kind of stuff or else things like Slack wouldn't be as popular as they are. People want convenience of push button and get a service. The um, the scuttlebutt that I heard and what what is concerning because um, if you just look into it, if you know the people involved, uh, it, it is apparently true Um People received layoff notices from Purism Saturday evening over the weekend. Uh, some of the people, like in their sales department, Sharif from Gnome, uh, and others were let go Saturday. They went home Friday thinking they had a job on Monday, and Saturday evening they got an email saying, you're let go. 
Jeez. And um, ouch. Now we are pivoting to services, which seems to be the popular. Brace yourselves, kids, because we're going to get a lot more of this over 2019 and 2020. Hey, I need a reoccurring revenue stream. Turns out selling and shipping to a free software market is hard to monetize. So let's go for reoccurring and let's figure out how we can rebadge some open source services and do this fundraiser style initiative. Now, my issue here is having been a previous backer of Purism's products is the previous products have not necessarily been 100 percent delivered on. The laptops didn't necessarily meet the original commitments. Now, they have iterated on that over time. The Librem 5 is currently the development edition is slightly delayed, unlikely to ship in July as promised. That's also a crowd raised product. And now we have services that are also crowdfunded while they're kind of quietly letting staff go on a Saturday night. How many people are involved in this in this project behind the scenes? Right. What's the, what's the company look like? Well, this is what I wanted to get to. So Purism is an interesting beast because they're a social purposes company uh, established here in Washington State. Now, they're, uh, they're a corporation in California, like they're a business out of California, but their social purposes status is out of Washington State. And God bless them. I think this is an interesting idea, especially if, let's just say, um, things really line up well, the Librem 5 ships, uh, uh, the... Uh, Librem 15 and those laptops do well. Pure OS gets a large user adoption. And you start having devices that are phones, laptops, and tablets all running Pure OS. You combine it with this Librem 1 service, and all of a sudden you're starting to see kind of an Apple iCloud model. Very much so. You can see the logic in it. That does not make it a reality. And the thing that really bothers me as a former sysadmin is... Just like we've seen with these streaming services like CBS All Access, companies that don't have this as their core focus think it's easy to just stand up a service real quick. Oh, I'll just, you know what? We'll get into services. We'll build some servers. We'll rebadge some software. We'll invest in security. We'll get a couple of really smart people on our team and we'll really build out a really scalable, secure infrastructure and we'll start offering services. To answer Alex's question on their, their core team page, there's currently about 22 people listed. Mm-hmm. And that really bothers me because companies with 22,000 employees can barely provide infrastructure grade reliable services. Companies like YouTube and ESPN have invested decades in their streaming infrastructure and in their storage infrastructure. And so for a company that's making laptops and now attempting to make a phone and topple Android, also wanting to get into services while having a small employee base that's essentially the size of my team to make podcasts nearly is crazy. It's crazy. Does anybody remember Mobile Me? With yeah. A- with Apple. That was a, a hot mess. And if Apple mm-hmm. can't do it, uh, and you know Canonical struggle with Ubuntu Touch, um, with a lot more people and a lot more money, I think he's, this guy's on Cloud nine, isn't he? Like, well, you know, you got to have a, you know, you do need to have a visionary, somebody who's willing to be bold. Todd is a bold, visionary character, and that draws a lot of people in. It helps if the vision is realistic, though. Well, here's what the issue is. And this is, see, we are, I think, because I hear from the audience all the time about this, is we're in the minority on this issue. Is what we're really facing here is, I think, the limitations of humanity. Seriously. The problem is, is that we are all tribal monkeys that want to be signaling constantly to each other. I agree with you. I belong in your tribe. I agree with what you believe. I want to be in your tribe. And so we do that by promoting things that seem great, ideas that reflect our ideals and our beliefs, like software freedom, like the ability to turn off your webcam, the ability to load your own operating system on your own phone. That kind of stuff is things that we believe in. Yeah. And so we want to see that propagate. We want to see that continue. So we want a virtue signal that we think that's great. So we tend to just talk about this stuff and lacquer over all of the obvious issues because deep down, we're all a bunch of optimists. 
And we want to see this stuff be successful. We want to believe there's a big enough market to buy free software phones. We want to believe a company like Purism can come around and change an entire entrenched industry that nearly goes back now a hundred years of legacy. We want to believe that's possible. And because we don't have the hands-on experience, we have no idea how complicated of a job it is. We frankly don't understand any of the dynamics involved in carrier agreements and getting something certified for a carrier network. We have no insights into any of that. We have no idea what it takes to manufacture a phone or to stamp out a motherboard or to write drivers for a modem. We have no concept of any of that. And so we sit back and go, mm, that seems possible. Yeah, that seems like that's something. that should be really easy. How hard could it be? Well, I sure hope they can get it. Well, let's give them another fundraiser. Let's raise more money because obviously it's going to go somewhere because I believe in this idea. And God forbid you don't believe in it because if you don't believe in it, then you don't love free software. You don't respect privacy. Don't, do you want the NSA listening to your phone calls, Wes? How could you no, not I support don't. the Librem 5? There's something wrong with you because you're skeptical. And that propagates shysters and crazy ideas because we love ourselves a great big moral idea. And if you got a company here like Purism who will tell you every three paragraphs that they're the moral authority in their blog, seriously, they go here, they list out the business models of Purism, Facebook, Google. All of them are horribly evil companies that want to track you and control you, except for Purism, which, quote, benefits society. Then at the bottom of this post, there's a bunch of random quotes that don't really have anything to do with the product. Like there's quotes in there from Stallman and other people. But the top quote. The top quote is from Todd Weaver, and the top quote says, society's technology genius is not lacking, but its moral genius is. Because Todd's going to be our moral authority, and he's going to guide us with his social purposes company into free software and hardware. Now, if you don't like free software, and if you don't like privacy, and you don't respect users' control over their computers, then why would you care something about Libra? Why, why would you back this? But if you do care, if you don't want them privacy, if you don't want them spying on you and invading your junk, well, then you should probably back this. And because I'm saying that they're a tiny company who isn't built to do something like this and who should be focusing on what they can do. And I'm the lunatic. I'm the crazy person. I'm the bad person. We, we, we all know this to be true. Gets me crazy. I think what you need to do is, is <clears throat> fund a much more grassroots level approach to solving this problem. So... Uh, the talk that I gave at, at Linux Fest Northwest, for example, was about writing your own firmware for your own home home assistant related home automation stuff. If you if you um, enable people, smart people, to write their own uh, firmwares or, or or you know 56k modem firmwares, we have no no concept of how difficult they are to write. If we make all of the bits that go into a phone open, then We've, we've seen over the years that open source will do amazing things with that technology. The baseband in the Purism phone, I have no idea how that works, but the baseband in my Android phone is a completely separate operating system that is a black box right. that the NSA probably have a, a backdoor right into. So my, my question really is, how, how can we audit what Libra's, uh, 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 Purism are doing? How, how can I, as a, an open source advocate, how can I sit here and say, yes, what they're doing is actually legit. I think this is the problem. Like I was saying earlier, we have no context. We have no concept of like even how hard it is to get the corner plastic pieces of the phone molded. We don't even know. We don't how long how long does it take to mold the corner pieces of the Librem 5? Does anybody know? Who right. who have they contracted to do that? We don't know any of this information. We're just told don't worry. Shh I we'll just, take care of it. I, we have a vision. Shh, shh, shh. I just got my Pixel 3 in the mail today. So it's sitting at home waiting for me, which yeah. I'm excited about. But even then, right, Google just admitted they were having how all the problems they've been having with that line. And they're a huge business who already has some of these deals in place and they still can't get a phone as cheap as they want it to be. So mm, exactly. How, how are we supposed to? Yeah. Now, I'm, I am curious. One option would be that we just shouldn't fund this sort of thing because it's not realistic. Well, and this but, is just going to be one of many. There's going to be other. Are there ways that they could communicate more? So maybe, you know, maybe some of the issue I think we're having is the unrealistic expectations and that there are a lot of people who don't know that and are then funding it, right? Are there ways that a business like this or a project like this could be more upfront about that? Say like, listen, we want your money. Do we know what we're doing? Maybe kind of we want to explore this. Buyer beware. You know what I think? I think no. Because I think what makes a company like Purism successful 
is by rolling hard into the freedom aspect of it and the privacy aspect of it. And by positioning themselves as a moral authority because they, they respect and, and, and um, try to um, enable user privacy, right? They're, they're, they're setting themselves as a moral authority leader. And um, when you're coming, when you're, when that's your brand, there's really no higher ground, right? There's you, there is no way to talk about this stuff in sort of a humble way right. because you've, you've already just crossed that out by the way that you're branding and marketing yourself. Right. So I, yep. I suspect there is no going back and, I also know from my own personality that I'm the type of person that when you get ri- when you get high on the uh, hyperbole scale, when you get what is, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's a good way to put that? Like, when you get really high on the like PR, yeah, yeah, it's just <laughs> I start it starts to trigger me. It just really does. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I also appreciate that to really reach the market they're trying to reach, they have to hit those notes really hard. This is going to be a model in a sense. I think you're going to have distributions that try to do things like this to try to monetize the user base. You look at what Apple's doing with iOS. They've looked at it and said, okay, well, we're having a hard time selling more iPhones. Well, we got a billion active iOS devices. Let's start monetizing that user base with services. So they're launching TV streaming services. They're going to launch all this crap. Everybody's going to do that. It's all going to be about the reoccurring eight bucks they can get out of you. And we're just, this is the beginning of many. What kind of bothers me about this one and this is really petty because this is open source free software, but they've lifted two of the icons for their apps, the mail app and the chat app. And I'm, I know the mail app. The mail app is the Geary icon. That's Geary just mail. Straight up. They just straight up lifted. Yep. And I, it's probably Absolutely. a free, it's probably a free icon, but I don't know. Cheese what it like, does that bother you? Like it bothers me. <laughs> I mean, you know, they uh, they could be working with the dev for all we know, right? Maybe it is Gary. And, and Maybe Libra Mail is Gary. No, because these are all Android apps. I should point out these are all Android and iOS apps. They're not Linux apps. Right. So, um, you know, maybe they're working with the team or maybe they at, hopefully they ask the team. So it'd be a really shitty thing to do uh, to just lift an icon for something else, which I mean, people do all the time. It's not like it doesn't happen all the time or not like Brent hasn't had a million of his photos taken and don't lifted and start. used don't on don't other stuff. Start. Right. So, I mean, it happens everywhere, whether it's in, you know, the open source world or not, you know, the whole thing, man, I see it's, it's interesting how they're, they're trying to provide a services type plan. Um, but you know, didn't Google one time say, don't be evil. Yeah, I right. I like, where do we where do we, we draw the line, and, and how do we trust how do we trust purism um, to be that company? I think there are other companies out there that are doing similar things, uh, the Pine guys, and they're just here's a piece of hardware. You know, this is for the community. This is for you guys. Use it, try it out, break it. You know, it's inexpensive. Yeah. Um. And and at this point, I feel like to some degree, it's a race to market between these two. And so, um, while maybe this was something that purism was going to do later, they decided to drop it earlier to create more buzz before. Because I really think these two companies, in particular, are racing to get out to market with something. Um. If anything, just for the the Linux and the open source community. Where's that recurring revenue going to come from? So Apple, we just said, you know, struggling to sell devices. I mean, they're, they're putting things on sale for the first time practically ever, all the time. Uh, if, if you know, like the Pine guys, you know, here's a piece of hardware, like you said. Wh- where does where does that upgrade cycle, where does that revenue to ke- sustain the company come from if they don't go into services? That's that, I think that's the that's the, the real question. Right? How, right. Do you, how do you sustain yep. an income? And well, I think that's when they 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 come up with a with another device. They keep iterating on that product, and if they can keep it in a in a price range that's reasonable, you've got to finish. Yeah, the there first would be one. no. Yeah, well, hard yeah, part too is there's I've, a smaller scale too, right? Like we might expect the mm-hmm. big guys to be able to make a new phone every year, every two years, but that, that's gonna that's gonna be a challenge. And even those big guys, those those annual phones are generally only fairly iterative. Yeah, right. Or, never, or Samsung who throws out just all the all the crap that they possibly can in mm-hmm. sticks. You know, there's entire YouTubers that make careers out of saying, is it worth upgrading? Mm-hmm. If you have to ask that question, yeah. no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I think, I think what I come back to is my core concern is I have a fundamental, and maybe it's outdated, but I have a fundamental belief that if you are going to offer data storage services like chat, like mail, and VPN tunneling where, you're, where you are also either white labeling or standing up VPN infrastructure, it is my outdated belief, I guess, that you need to be a specialist in services. You need to know how to run servers. It needs to be what you do. Now, that said, if I was going to pay a monthly money for something like this, I suppose I like the option of being able to use 
stuff that's all based on open source software. It's it's funny if, if this was the only thing that they were doing. Yes, I, I would believe if that they, they could started do this. with this. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah, that's what's so weird is if they started with this, I would not be nearly as skeptical. But because it seems like it kind of seems like flailing around a little bit. We're going to do a tablet. We're going to do laptops. We're going to do this. They know? can't even get the SSL cert for their VPN domain right. Oh, is it still screwed up as of now? Yeah, that's been since Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I know. I thought mm. maybe I thought maybe by the time they announced it, they'd have it fixed. Yeah, I, I have not tried the VPN. I, I, I trust them now. <laughs> is it possible that they're just really good at selling ideas and not so good at carrying them through? That's kind of what we've seen in the last few years is that their their ideas are are actually quite sound. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. However, the, the bringing to market is where things are falling apart a little bit. Ideas are sexy and tempting and... Easy to write on a web page. Uh-huh. It's much easier to say, I'm going to do this than actually doing this. Right. And I think I'm a big believer that actually shipping is is the difference between professionals and amateurs. Like actually getting it shipped out there in a, something that you can you can feel good about is harder than coming up with the idea. And the last 10 percent is so cliche, but the last 10 percent is the hardest part. Look, so. look at the number of people that say, I'm going to do a podcast and then yeah. Yeah. don't ship every week like you do. Yeah, or all kinds of things, right? People get, and that's fine, you know, for some people. It's just, uh, really, it's that they are built, that we, we are billing them as this big name with a big project and idea that's really important that we should support. And there are aspects that, like you said, the philosophy that we agree with, but we just, we need to be realistic about yeah. the scale and expectations. And um, given enough time and given enough resources, they may be able to get there. But right now, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the look of the constant fundraiser thing either. It's concerning to me that they're not at a sustainable point now. I know you could argue, well, they're a social purposes company, and so blah, 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 they give money back, blah, blah. I don't buy it. Simply don't buy it. Yeah, I think it introduces a, a large amount of uncertainty in their finances, and that I'm sure makes it hard to plan for on their end, which only makes it even harder for us to have any idea what's actually going on. Yeah. So what's the alternative then? Let's play devil's advocate for a second. If, if you were Todd... And you wanted to build a sustainable company around this stuff. What other choice does he have? Well, uh, going back to Wes's point, sorry to interrupt, but going back to Wes's point, I think um, I think if they would have started with services, I think part of it is I've never really believed the tablet and phone hype that they've they've had, and, it's, and that has always since they've since they've gone down that route, they've really kind of dropped down in credibility in my book because uh, not only is it a insurmountable problem. It is a problem that is solved. We should be figuring out the next major platform and getting open source and free software there first for once, instead of spending five, six years, a decade after the fact, trying to catch up and even come barely close to feature parity. It just seems like um, a fool's errand, because even if you get there, the market isn't standing still. And it eventually, by the time you get a com- competent product, the next wave, be it wearables or VR headsets or implants or whatever it is, will be here, will be arrived. Like the, the, it'll be the people that are working on that are, will have started. So and we'll just be missing that boat now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't, isn't that why Ubuntu Touch ended up in the way it did? It was, you know, the, the pace of, of the market is such that unless you are Apple or Google, it's almost impossible to keep up. Yeah, I heard this weekend from people who were familiar with the matter that uh, looking at the videos, like the the, the videos that uh, developers have released and that uh, Purism has released, that uh, there where Canonical was about four years ago, which was about two years from like getting deals with BQ and whatnot. So we'll see. And so what happens if if you've contributed to this this crowdfunding thing and it and it doesn't ship? Well, then you con- you contributed to a good cause. Okay. I wonder uh, if. A different business model might be helpful, and I have an idea to grow on what you were just uh, talking about. So I'm glad you interrupted me because it grew my idea a little bit, <laughs> gave me a little bit of time. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if they might be, you know, since their their strength is ideas and vision, it seems, or at least um, some moral high ground that is um, a lot of people appreciate. I wonder if it might be a good idea to, instead of concentrating on products, which is where their weak point seems to be on shipping products, I wonder if there might be a, almost like a Patreon style funding for their business. If they're going to be... basically what they're doing, isn't it? Yeah, but they're tying it to a specific product. So what if you are instead funding them to grow ideas and be almost a think tank to try to get open source 
uh, ahead of the curve for maybe once. just be more honest <laughs> like because that's probably I mean probably these fundraisers do go to keep the company going of course it's Cr- pretty crowd, obvious crowdsourced VC funding that's what that yeah was. almost <laughs> exactly uh, all right well we spent way too much time it'll be interesting to see where it goes you know that's this is the ultimate this is one of our this is one of our more ponderous stories the ultimate ponderous ponderous story for the last few years just last point apparently they've quietly dumped the tablet yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. chat room says. yeah all right well few things to talk about. Looks like Elle joined us in the mumble room. No. Uh, she's on her way down to DockerCon right now. So if you're going to be at DockerCon, say hi to Elle. Are you, at, uh, are you at the airport right now, Elle? I am, if you can hear with all the background noise. How is Payne Field? It's tiny. It took five minutes to get through security. It was amazing. Perfect. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. We have a live, we have Al on the scene at Painfield right now. You guys know how. That's awesome. I've been talking about Painfield the whole weekend. I'm just so jealous. All of the that. locals are jealous of you, Al. So yeah. Yeah, totally jealous. So uh, Al's got to what? A couple hour flight down to San Francisco and then it's DockerCon time. Yeah, DockerCon party. People should join me there. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how should they find you? Look for the hair? Follow you on That's Twitter? That's what I do. Yeah, just look for the hair or just ask somebody. I hate to say it, but somebody will have seen my hair. <laughs> <laughs> they know who she is. Do you know the girl with the great hair and uh, also knows all the things about containers? <laughs> cool. That'll be great. And there may be a couple of stickers. You never know. Depends. Supplies while, while supplies last. Oh, my. Those stickers. <laughs> these mm, hot stuff. They're, they're pretty good. They're pretty good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're able to give us a uh, on location uh, pain field report. L. Safe travels. Well, Wes has dared me to go and preach the gospel of LXD, so we shall see if it's safe travels or not. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I believe in you. Into the wolf's den with that one. <laughs> Did you put her up to that? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I saw her for all of, I don't know, 10 seconds while she was hopping out of, from the studio to go catch this flight. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know. good. Um, next week, Red Hat Summit. Wes, Cheese, and I will be at Red Hat Summit. Alex, are you going to Red Hat Summit? The, the Red Hatter is not going to Red Hat Summit. No. That's <laughs> ironic. That's <laughs> silly, isn't it? <laughs> I've just not found anyone's budget to put the expenses against. Mm, so. Right. There mm, you go. Yeah. Yeah. You just start making the expenses, and then they'll tell you where to put it. That's how it works. Yeah. My <laughs> bank account, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very fair. I, I totally understand. No, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of competition internally for people to, to go to Red Hat Summit. So oh, I bet. You have to submit a talk, or you have to be actually associated with one of the products. Does anything get done around Red Hat the weeks before the summit? Yeah, a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people doing an awful lot of work. To get, crunch, to get yeah, ready. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's an awful lot of OpenShift announcements coming up at the summit this year. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of work been happening for months, if not years, to prepare for this because it's a big release coming up. So, oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad we're going. Ooh. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the reasons I'm sad I'm not. It's because OpenShift's the product I work cl- m- most closely with. Um, and it's going to be a big... Big announcement. Hmm. Hmm. Now, one last little bit of housekeeping before we skadoots. <laughs> that's, that's what we're about to do. We'll find this, out what it means. This, this is what happens when I haven't slept. I say things like skadoots. I haven't. Have you ever heard me? Have you ever heard me ever say skadoots? Oh, well, I just you heard, heard you about four times. Skadoots. Dudes, Maybe if it dudes. was the uh, name of a project that you were trying to pronounce. Yeah, yeah, and it would, it would be a total mispronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to mention that Linux Academy was getting a bunch of great feedback on the uh, promo, the two ninety nine yearly promo. Normally the price is four forty nine. It's two ninety nine right now. They've extended it for just another five days. That's a great deal. That's like a thirty three percent. That's actually exactly a thirty three percent discount. So LinuxAcademy dot com. Go take advantage of that because that's crazy. That's crazy. That's a that's a mighty fine. It's a mighty fine deal, Wes. As, as someone who has had, has paid the full price before being associated at all, yeah, it, uh, that seems nice. There you go. There, right there. That was the uh, the keeping of the house. We're all done. Very nice. We got through that nice and quick. Got that. Got that through really good. Well, as I said, we're all back from Linux Fest Northwest, and uh, Cheese just got in last night. Uh, yeah, yeah, last night around. Uh, 10.30, 10.45. Oh, that's late. My dogs went crazy ballistic. Well, Cheese, what did you think as your first Linux Fest Northwest? Was it worth, or no, that's not the way I want to put it. Was it everything we've been talking about for years on the air? Absolutely, yeah. Did not disappoint? Did not disappoint. Wow. It was, uh, that, oh, boy. Because we've been hyping it, it a lot. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I was kind of going into it expecting, you know, a conference of Fest. Um you know, just a, a kind of a small one. Um, 
but I did not realize how much it just, it actually felt more like a giant family reunion than, than anything else. Even with like that one crazy aunt, like it was still this, this giant family reunion. Yeah. Um, Who's the crazy just, aunt? That's why I want to know. Mm, mm, who was the crazy I, I, I don't know. Noah. I'll have to think. <laughs> Actually, I think it might have been <laughs> Noah this year. <laughs> he, was, he, did, he did get kind of crazy. He aunt, did. Didn't he? Yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, it's there. <laughs> I got a story. I, I agree with you, Cheese, by the way. Family reunion. And a lot of these people I'd never or I'd met Chris once before, but I'd never met Wes or like half the crew I'd never met before. And yet, because their voices have been such a part of my life for so many years, it felt like a family reunion. That's yeah. a really nice way to yeah. put it. Yeah, this year more so, I think, than ever. It really did. It and was. I, th- I think it was really interesting, too, because you could tell, especially at the studio when we had uh, just a gr- you know, group of us hanging around, just all of the voices. <laughs> it, was, it was super surreal because all the voices that you hear on the podcast, everyone's in a conversation talking here, there. Uh, it was, it was definitely interesting. They're people with you know, bodies and heads. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I met Joe, he, uh, he looked at me kind of strange when I said, oh, hey, I'm Brent. Nice to meet you, Joe. And he said, uh, oh, you're not what I expected. And I had to ask him, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because you're not what I expected either. So. <laughs> I thought that about Joe. Joe looked nothing like I expected. Right. Yeah. He looked nothing like his picture. You get, sure. Yeah, you have that moment. True. And then, and then it, it passes. And then, then it just kind of becomes normal because yeah. you fuse the voice with the person, which yeah. is good. Surprisingly quickly in almost all cases, you know, yeah. and it is a little different. Some people are, are look very different, but uh, geez, we had also not met. And I feel like meeting you, it, it was, it was just great. I, I mean, I had seen your picture, but it really was. Yeah, just I felt like, like we were friends. just like brothers or something like, Hey, oh, cool. Yeah. You got some beers. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And like where else that happens with people, you know, maybe people you've known from podcasts, but even just other people at yeah. Linux Fest, right? Yeah. You just strike up conversations. Yeah, it's you not don't just, have to make awkward small talk. Yeah. You have all the things you to have talk the about. same vocabulary, you know, and like the same things. So it's not just the, it's not just us on air. It's that's, it's like that for everybody. It really is. Um, and this year was, was our biggest Linux Fest. In, in several ways. The one thing that we really did big time this year that was a massive success that we've never done before, and I think now we have to do it every single year, is there was a Jupiter track, a room that was just loaded full of Linux Academy and community members that uh, had talks, and Wes had the privilege of giving the very first talk oh very early in the Jupiter room. How's everyone doing today? Yeah. Happy Linux Fest Northwest. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but 9.30 is just about the earliest possible time I think conference talk should be scheduled. Yes. <laughs> you had a packed room. That was Everybody great. had a packed room. It was, I, it was very humbling, the number of people that came to our room. It was just quite incredible. I'm not joking. I had two different people tell me they were emotionally moved by Elle's talk this, on the second day. I wanted to go see, you know, like yeah, my co-host I, Jim, I wanted to go see his talk. I couldn't. No. It was full by the time I got there. You couldn't even go into Alan's talk because they just closed the room. They put a sign up that said, no more people. <laughs> It's well, crazy. Some of us just walked past the sign and sat down anyway. But yeah. <laughs> right. The live stream wasn't full, so I got in there. You know, that, yeah. that's always open. Yeah, we did have we did try to get the audio on the live stream. We'll try to get the audio posted up on our site and uh, the slides up on GitHub or something pretty soon once we get everybody. Yeah. And yeah. once everybody's done traveling. I know Elle was really nervous about her talk, and I thought she did a great job. I, I thought, you know, I thought the feedback, are you still there? Oh, what'd you think? How did it go? Because I thought the feedback for your talk was particularly good for, out of all the talks. Um, well, I always love doing the container talk because that one's always really fun. People get really excited and I love it when people actually turn in the homework I give them. But the mentoring talk was the hardest one this time because it is telling my story. And I was really happy to see how many people came to a community-based talk at a technical conference. That was just really heartwarming to me. Yeah, it's something people are taking seriously. That is good to see. And I think I think Linux Fest Northwest in particular has a lot of that vibe. I, I've noticed over the years a number of talks that, that will focus around that. You know, it is because it is a community driven event, people are thinking about it already. I really liked your talk on Linux audio. You got into like even the science of how sound moves around a room and the oh, different you microphones know me, I'm work. A nerd. Yeah, it was great. It was really nerdy. <laughs> and Alex, your talk was packed on home automation. People were even uh, sitting on the floor in front of the projectors and stuff. It was a bit daunting, yeah. Somebody told me 80, 83 people or 88 people or something. Wow. Yeah, we just got to get a bigger room. In a room for 30. Yeah, this is a was, class, yeah. normal classroom <laughs> size. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 87 in oh, Alex's talk. Yeah, 87 yeah. is what I counted. That's a lot of people. And yeah. I like how, like, toward the end, they just had to start putting, you know, like on Alan's talk. <laughs> no more. <laughs> <Full>. because <laughs> Because we were cramming as many people as possible in there. 
And, and we also got rid of a ton of the uh, vintage swag in there too. Yeah, we had the old. We were giving a lot of uh, that. People love that stuff. You know, I've been most amazed by since the talk is the interactions on Twitter. Since people have been actively seeking me out, and you know, people I've never met or talked to are just like, "Hey, you know, like your talk. How do I find out more information?" So there is a blog post I wrote about it, which uh, I'll get when you throw in the show notes or yeah. something. Yeah, for the um, home automation stuff, which is so cool. Yeah. The uh, other talks were, there were some other popular ones too. Um, I think one that uh, I'll, I'll have a link for in the show notes because it was a great one was Mad Dog's uh, 50 years or something. It was unbelievable. It couldn't have been 50. It, but uh, it was a, a long history of X. Hey, you know, in fact, I have a clip right here of just the intro where I think he says it. Here, I'll play a little bit of it. Welcome. This is talk is the 50 years wow. of X, a computer odyssey. And it's not just a remunition of history about Unix and things like that, but I want to explain some things maybe to some of the younger people and maybe to some of the older ones who keep this information in the back of their head, and I'm going to bring it back out to the frontal lobes. Yeah, I just didn't think 50 was possible, but it is. That whole talk's great. The entire talk is linked in the show notes. Also in the show notes, if you want although I don't know why you would, our entire eight-hour stream from Linux Fest, uh, which uh, kicked off with a bang. We are here at Linux Fest. They just opened the doors uh, about eight minutes ago. And of course, there was a lot of people waiting to get their badges, which this year are plantable. Did you guys try that? Did anybody try planting their badge? Well, not yet, no. It's recycled yet, paper no. with seeds in it. I saw Alan's there earlier. I'm going to take it home. <laughs> They, these badges look like uh, crumpled toilet paper. Yes, they were Just, the yeah. strangest badges I've they ever seen. They worked well the first day. On the yeah. second day, they were looking extra yeah. crumpled. A lot fell apart. Did yeah. they start disintegrating? Yeah. Is that, yeah. yeah. Where, Biodegradable where the, in a day. Where the neck, um, like, what do you call that? The, the hole. The punch. hole punch. For, yeah. Yeah, the, the hole punch where you would clip it in was would just rip out. Yeah, the second yeah I noticed uh, the, on the second day they started taping that before they would give it to the person. Yep. Ah. So they would like tape over with it to reinforce it a bit, yeah. <laughs> but then you got to rip the tape off before you yeah, plant it. Yeah. Nice bit of yeah. plastic on your biodegradable <laughs> badge. Um, so I sat down on the stream for a while with Angela and, and yourself, Chris, but then Dylan popped up for a while, and that kid knows his Mario music. <laughs> yeah, he does. My goodness. Yeah, yeah that was fun. I, that's about halfway through the stream. Uh, Chase starts quizzing Dylan on different Mario oh. tunes to see if he can t to nail him. That is his specialist subject if ever he goes on a quiz. Yeah, it is. That is. He is all about it. That in Minecraft. Um, the, the most fun, I mean, I'm really trying to, trying to, to think of what it could be because there was, there was great road adventures we went on. We went on a hike to a lake. There was sightseeing. There was so many good meals. But it would be sort of negligent on my part not to spend a little bit of time talking about our parking lot barbecue, right? <laughs> like, out of all the stories I could share, yeah. this is, oh, I yeah. think, with our limited time, the one I have to share. Wow. Well, lesson learned. Uh, we're going to need more barbecues. <laughs> we're going to need a lot more grills. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like pretty soon you'll need a bigger parking lot, too. <laughs> it was it was unbelievable. Uh, Cheese and the Bruce, a.k.a. Brandon, saved the day it was a massive scale operation way beyond anything we planned over 300 people showed up to get fed all of two grills two One, like hibachi oh. style yeah no yeah. Uh, yeah the 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 little grill i mean that's just laughable it, yeah, yeah the like so you texans, walk up from that lawn yeah the texans chris were giving me lots of feedback on the size of your grill yeah oh you, you need a trailer to fit a whole hog in next time it hasn't been an mm -hmm. issue in the years past but yeah. this this year uh it went big and the the, the beauty thing that happened is cheese and Brandon like fell into this system. The, the only only way to do this when you're trying to feed 300 people is to have a system. I had no system. If I hadn't gotten injured during the cooking process, I smacked myself in the nose with a spatula. Then we would have been a wreck. <laughs> Listen to their system here. Listen, this is great. Anybody waiting on sausage? Brats to the front of the line. That's cheese right there. As it should be. <laughs> I just one more time because it's it's I gotta play that last part because it's so great. Oh yeah. Very nice. That was good times, man. And uh, I, you know, whenever it came down to it, uh, and I think Bruce, if if he's in the mobile, you should jump in here too, but uh 
you know, I asked him, I was like, Hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to cook it? Or do you want, you know, you want me to, to prep it? And he was like, I'll cook. So, <laughs> all right, man. I just started busting out of the hamburger patties. I was throwing them on the grill. He's flipping them. We're cooking as quick as we can. Yeah. Uh, we ran out of charcoal. Uh, Twice. Yeah. It was, I think we had to keep yeah. going for charcoal runs. And then eventually we went for supplementary pizza runs to like, mm-hmm. to re to alleviate the lines. Um, and then it was a good time though, as the party sort of settled, you know, the people that had been drinking kind of held, stayed back so they could sober up or kept drinking. Some of us retired into the RV and played ukulele a little bit and others decided to cross dress like, <laughs> like, oh man, like Noah Chalaya. And I happened to catch the moment when Noah decided to put on Emma's bathing suit from System 76. Here's what's happening right now is Noah's putting on Emma's bathing suit. Uh, which is a... Uh, I'm not sure. He the back door, Emma. I guess. All right, I got it. Okay. Teamwork. That's good. Okay, you're looking good. This is looking good. Okay, ladies. Noah, there's no polite way to say this, but man, you look pregnant. <laughs> I mean, I don't want a body shame. It got a little crazy. It just got a little, and then Noah was running around in a bathing suit for a little bit. It's good times. I just feel bad for Emma. I mean, is she going to, I assume she'll just throw that one away and get yeah, something. That, yeah, that, so that suit would never be the same again, will it? Well, if you if you listen to the very the very first of that clip in the background, you can hear Noah say, oh, I think I just ripped the leg hole. Yeah, or yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that happened. Oh, and we had Jeff uh, up from California, the guy that helped do the wiring for your RV, and mm-hmm. he was flying some drones around. That was fun. One of the best moments of the barbecue, actually, because yeah. Jess, uh, what, what are those called? What are those, what are those drones called that Jeff had? FPV drones. Very fast. Yeah. And uh, he had the goggles, so you could put on like VR goggles. Plus, he had an auxiliary display screen so other people could watch. And we were playing around for quite a while, and Levi starts to get hip to the fact that there's a thing flying around that's like an insect. And maybe that should get out of my backyard, he starts to think to himself. So he spends a couple of hours chasing the drone until one beautiful moment when Levi manages to catch the drone in his little dog mouth and he catches it such that the camera faces uh. outwards. So you then get a point of view from Levi as he s- does a celebratory run around the parking lot, just totally pleased with himself for cap- finally capturing this drone. As he should be. That Best is person impressive. dog view. Yeah, it and was then you, great. Yeah, then you look over at the people with the VR headsets on just laughing because they're, <laughs> they're seeing the world from Levi's point of view. And boy, does that dog move. Yeah. He just booked around. It's a big party. He's a cutie. That was, he yeah. loves that. He loves that barbecue. He loves it because he gets to, he gets all kinds of scratches and scraps. It's perfect for him. It was a lot of fun. And thank you to everybody who made it out. It was great to see you. Didn't get a chance to chat a lot with everybody, but tried to shake as many hands as possible. Yeah. I mean, it was an amazing diversity of people. I think we got, you know, lots of regulars and lots of people who might just be now learning about the network, Linux Academy and, and everyone involved. Yeah. And I just saw a great amount of, of mixing, you know, like you would, you would have groups that would form, but then new people would come in, mm-hmm. others would leave. It was mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah, there was a lot of that. Yeah, and uh, people weren't too creepy about Lady Jupes that, this year. That was nice. That was good. Yeah, the awkward part yeah. is you do have your home parked yeah. here right next door. <laughs> good toilet etiquette. It did work out. It worked out. Other than the fact that the toilet got overflowed. But that's another Aww, story. And really. I just have to drive people's poops down the highway. Yeah, yeah. I, and I am still <laughs> carrying their poops around in Lady Jupes. That, that is also true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I Big think thank you to System Seventy Six too, man. Yeah, they oh, really pulled geez. it off. Amazing! Geez. Wow. So, so awesome. The barbecue would, uh, just straight up would not have been possible without them. And man, when Emma saw the crowds that we were getting, they went out and did another meat run. And uh, she also set aside a couple of sirloins for those of us <laughs> in the crew that were hanging out late. So after things kind of died down a little bit, when the coals were still going, just a little quick salt and pepper on the old sirloins, threw them on the grill, and we. Had ourselves a little more, a little more meat. I, I ate a bit of cheese's meat, and it was delicious. Yeah, yeah, he's got some good meat. He really does. Was there some bacon on there? <laughs> no bacon. No, it was just steak. And That's oh, what that, we should have that for next steak. Year. That steak, sans bacon, was good enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. They also grabbed a bunch of chairs and just a ton of stuff. So System Seventy Six was just above and beyond. Went above and beyond with the barbecue. And uh, Emma just left the studio a couple hours ago. She went out to breakfast there with Brent, and uh, they went out and uh, tried the tried a restaurant that I used to go to as a child. The Bluebird Cafe. Awesome. Bluebird Cafe. Emma, um, 
impressed me because she ordered two very large blueberry pancakes and then proceeded to order um, a cup of ice cream and uh, ate it, all of the pancakes with the ice cream. I had never seen that before. She earned it. She had a hell of a day. I think Popey and Wimpy would have really enjoyed that experience. It was so good seeing them. Really so good. So good seeing them. We're, we have so many stories I want to share on the Friday stream. I just, I think we should, some of the, like the non Linux related stories we'll put there. Uh, but I'll wrap up this Linux Fest uh, uh, review by saying hell of a year. Great, great talks, great crowd, great exhibit hall. People were into the raffle this year, and we just blew the doors off the barbecue. And the Jupiter track was so much more successful than I would have thought. Like, I thought we'd have attendance. I just didn't think we would have that much attendance. It was... Especially because, I mean, there were a lot of other really interesting talks at yeah. the conference. Like, it's not like we had the, all the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, although we had some pretty great we did, stuff. I mean, we had some great <laughs> stuff. Oh, absolutely. Really the one, the only. I will, I will try to work with as many people as possible to get... Um, to get those up online, we'll have a link to Alex's talk. We'll try to get some of the audio posted. I recorded nearly all of them in audio. We weren't doing video, but I think we might try to get like a video of the of the uh, slides next year. But we will at least have the source slides up on GitHub eventually in a week or so. It was really lovely, actually. So my mom and dad were listening in England to the audio stream, and they text me what? both text me both afterwards saying that was that was fun. So thank you for making that. That's great. Possible. Yeah. That's also, awesome. we heard from people that had to leave the fest early, but got to keep streaming as they were on their way to the airport. That's also really cool. Mm -hmm. Definitely a hat tip for, to Chase for making that just whew, make that making it oh, smooth. Yeah. That's yeah. A, that was awesome. Yeah. Great. Great yeah. point. Yeah. Geekgamer.tv to check out what he's doing. And you walked away with a bit of a plasma success story, too. That's, I mean, if that's not something, I mean, uh, yeah, trip true. worth it, right? Worth flying so many people out here. <laughs> oh, for that. Yeah, I was I was attending a really interesting talk about, um, it was like a live coding demo and someone was, you know, my little hobby language of Clojure. Uh, there's a JavaScript version. They were making a Minesweeper game just like live right there in the browser. Didn't need any supplies. Their laptop wasn't working working so well, so some of the some of the other staff and volunteers had had been trying to get things set up on another laptop. I guess that room had been having projector problems, and that we happens. should say like, there's a lot of rooms. It is a complicated setup, especially with the live streaming and the mixing and the recording. So there was another um, another distro out there with the with the green logo. I won't mention by <laughs> name, and you know it just couldn't it just couldn't cut it on the. Couldn't cut it on the projector. Really? Like it wasn't detecting it? Y yeah. What no, was the it, desktop environment? Was it, it was Linux Mint. That's what it, it was. It was oh, Cinnamon on Linux Mint. Actually, I'm, actually was, I thought it was Sousa. Did you think Sousa when he said green? There aren't many with green logo. Absolutely. I, I thought I, Sousa. I Susie. Yeah. <laughs> I had Mint. <laughs> oh, did you? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing against it. Fine distribution. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, it's Cinnamon then. It, it was like it wasn't finding it and then eventually it did. But have you ever seen that where like the, um, it's just shifted? So you have like multiple desktops yes. that you can see where, where the desktops end and begin? wasn't going to cut it for the presentation. But I had just given a presentation that morning. So you knew it's going to be, yep. it's going to work, right? I got a laptop. Yep. I don't need it. I was here for the talk anyway. So I'm, I just go and volunteer, stick my laptop up there, plug it in, Windows key P, choose, you know, mirror the things. No problem. Worked perfectly. And no, no, no credit to me. It was. I was just really glad that Plasma is so dependable. Yes. It works so well in that sort of setting. It does setting. so good with projectors. It really does. And that meant I actually got to enjoy the talk. Oh, that's great. That is a nice win. I also will say, I mean, so there's a, there's a Plasma success, success story. I have a bit of an XFCE success story. Um, and it's a bit out, Joe. I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> don't let don't don't let anybody else hear this. Uh, I didn't bring my power cord because I'm lazy. I mean, I had it because it's USB C. You are so lazy about power cords. <laughs> I know. I hate power cords. Ran my laptop, my T480, both days, recording all of the talks, except for like the last couple of talks of the Sunday, all from battery the entire time. Wow. I just left it in the room overnight sleeping, came in the next day, fired it back. I mean, just all from XFCE sips. My, sips. Wow. my experience amazing, of XFCE is, is limited still, but um, when Plasma's on, I've got a four, T480S ThinkPad. And, you know, you can feel that thing when it's running plasma. You, you can feel it under your fingers. It's a few degrees warmer than, than your hands yes, are. Yes, yes. Uh, but XFC, it's actually cooler. And the fan turns off completely. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, from, it's a big difference. Yeah, it's not pushing the uh, GPU much, as much, I imagine. All right, well, so I think we have enough time. I think we're going to try to slip in. We have a brand new segment for the show. Ooh. I'm very, very excited about this. Ladies and gentlemen... Jason Evangelo and El Marquez both have commitment issues when it comes to picking a distribution. So instead of suffering, they have decided to make a new segment called The Distro Hoppers. And they kick it off with 
a new random distribution they've picked. And that, am I, am I building the tension yet? Just get on with it, man. <laughs> <laughs> and that distribution is Linux Lite. You know, I was actually really afraid. I was gonna, I was afraid that we were gonna end up with something really weird, like you know, a NAS specific, you know, Linux distribution. So when I clicked the button and Linux Lite OS popped up, it was, it was actually kind of relieving because I was like, okay, I can do this. I can look at this OS and actually give honest feedback to what it would be to somebody who's new to Linux. I want to start with the minimum recommended specs for this distro because it's it's billed as really lightweight. And all you need for it is a one gigahertz processor and 768 megabytes of RAM. And I think even the recommended requirements are something like uh, a 1.5 gigahertz processor and two gigs of RAM. That's recommended. So that's like when it will really scream. Linux Academy recently sent me some USBs to give away. And these things are like two gigs in size. They're tiny. There's nothing you can actually do with them. So I have a bunch of them sitting around and I put Linux Lite on it. And I put it into the computer and I could actually run off of it. Like you could have a functional OS on a two gig USB that you can now use. That was amazing to me because I can't even burn most ISOs on something under eight gigs at this point. Did it run well with the live USB? Honestly, yeah, it did. Um, My daughter has this little bitty laptop that we bought on sale on Back Friday that I just regret because that thing runs like mud with, you know, (laughs) real specs to it. It's, you know, Lenovo something pad, like the oldest version possible. Linux Lite was running off of this USB faster and more user-friendly than that laptop has ever run. So did you get around to doing an actual native install onto the hard drive? Okay, so this one, I kind of started getting out of my comfort zone because on that laptop, I was running Fedora. And because I give it to my kids, I like having it as secure as possible. So I ended up leaving EUFI actually enabled on it and no problem with Fedora, but I couldn't even get it to read the USB or boot up to Linux Lite OS without going back to legacy boot. So I don't know if that is a concern for some people. I you know, it really goes back to how much work are you doing that requires security. But I ended up going ahead and going to the legacy, going through the boot process. You had told me that this was very similar to the Ubuntu uh, boot process. I haven't gone through that, so I can't speak to that. But it was really native. It was very simple. The English in which it asked how I'd like my install to happen was very user friendly, like somebody off the street who generally doesn't even really mess with installs or even computers could understand what it was asking. You know, are you sure that you actually want to erase everything on this drive? And then you click yes, and it says, specifically, these are the areas that are going to be deleted if you accept this. Yes. And it's like, what keyboard would you like? And even gives you a little bar at the bottom so you can test to make sure that your keyboard is functioning with the option that's chosen. So you don't go through the entire process and then find out later that you made a mistake. Um, The fact that it prompts you to ask you about third-party drivers and Wi-Fi before you even get into the mix, I think eliminates a lot of the issues that people who are brand new run into when they kick an OS. Yeah, so it uses the Ubiquiti installer, which is the same installer that Ubuntu uses, and it's just as simple. It may have some slight language tweaks, like you pointed out, but yeah, it's basically click next, click next, click next. Let's talk about the first boot. Let's talk about your first experience. Did you spend any time in the Linux Lite OS welcome screen? I did. And that's because this is kind of interesting. So when I was going through the boot process, there was a little option that said, you know, do you want to go ahead and install updates? So I said, yes, I do. You know, why not do it all at one point? Then it goes in and the little welcome screen shows up and it's like, first thing it says is to install updates. And I'm thinking, well, I already did that, but let's, you know, hey, I'm test driving this. And I click the button and I was really surprised that there were packages there that needed to be updated. So I'm not sure what the disconnect is there. Did you happen to see that? I didn't actually notice that because I did the same exact thing, but I skipped down because there's like four steps and I basically ignored that because I had updated already and I went through the remaining steps. But then so I was going through the welcome screen and just kind of looking at all the different options. And I do like how you're picking as you're picking them. It actually has information to what it is that you're doing. It doesn't just assume that if you're running updates or that if you're choosing another one of the options that you are already going to know what that's going to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's very I found the language on this OS to be very explicit. It's very clear and it it assumes 
that you are new to Linux. And I really love that. And this welcome screen, probably my favorite welcome screen since Ubuntu Budgie's welcome app. Because what this does is it just guides you through every step. It's you know, install updates, install drivers, set a restore point. That's another cool thing is that it actually suggests to you, hey, set a restore point so that you can have a backup down the road. It's like it knows you're going to screw it up at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's links to you know all their support pages and forums and social media. And they even have this hardware compatibility database that's just for Linux Lite OS. There's thousands and thousands of reports on there from people who have volunteered their their hardware information, kind of similar to what you get with the Steam hardware survey. So in your case, like if you were, you know, booting up that live USB, you could click that hardware compatibility database and see if your components or your system is perfectly supported by Linux Lite. I don't know if you had a chance to open up the terminal when you did this, but I find it interesting that as soon as you open up the terminal, there's actually a link to that same support guide right there. And I saw that throughout, like you down to menu and they give you the support docs. So they're making the option of support like first and foremost through your entire experience in the OS. Well, if my support docs were this good, I would want to link them everywhere too. It, the documentation for Linux Lite is so good. It's all super detailed and it's really easy to follow. There are visuals, actual screenshots of everything you could possibly imagine. You know, one of my qualms with so many Linux distros is that there's this lack of education about all these different drivers that are out there for AMD and NVIDIA. And this breaks it down in really simple language. And it even has this section where it's like, okay, if you want to, if you don't know what graphics card you have, do you have AMD? Do you have NVIDIA? Open up a terminal and type this. And then there's tutorials on customizing it, how to use a VM, how to use TimeShift to create and restore backups. There's troubleshooting tips, and it's so well done. And I flipped over to Zubuntu in a VM because I wanted to see, okay, what's kind of the, the big XFCE-based distro that would compete with this? So I fired up Zubuntu, and I went into their documentation, and it's just... It's laid out very cleanly, but it's all text. I don't think we can make light or even just kind of glaze over the fact that how documented their screenshots are. I would argue that you could actually take the text out of most of those support guides and still be able to know exactly what you're supposed to be doing by going through those screenshots. Mm. Okay, did you did you happen to dig into the menus and notice something called light tweaks? I did. And that's because, um, so I actually went looking for it simply because whenever I opened up settings and configuration files, I don't know if you noticed, but there's no minimize bar. So I just assumed that I had to go in and install it the way that I had with elementary OS. So I was looking for that setting and then suddenly realized that my computer and other options do have the minimize bar. It's kind of hit and miss on which ones do, hmm. but that's how I ended up finding that option. So I really like this. It's not the most attractive app, but it's super useful. It's got, I don't know, 12, 15 different tweaks that you can run. Uh, you can fix your boot process. You can locate large files. You can clean the Firefox cache. Uh, it'll show you how much space you'll clean out if you, you know, execute this tweak or this tweak. What's really neat about it is it shows you before you execute the tweak, would you like to clean out 63 megabytes of Firefox cache? Would you like to clear seven recent entries from your favorites menu? And so it's updating that in real time. And I think that's really cool because when you're on Windows, you, you have to, you know, go into the, you know, right click the disk and hit properties and then hit some other thing and and then run it and analyze it until finally it tells you this is how much space you'll clear. The light tweaks menu is the first time that I saw something on this OS that I'm going, okay, this is targeted to more than just new people. Because I don't know if you noticed, it actually has some higher level kind of Linux user experience, like installing new kernels, removing new kernels, things that I would say that I would always do on the command line because I can't imagine a GUI running for me. And then it grades, like, how severe is this action? Is it something safe and I really can't hurt my system? Or, you know, proceed with caution, it's possible you're going to break everything. Because I can imagine somebody coming in here just be like, oh, what's a kernel? I don't need it. <laughs> and removing their kernel. 
<laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you get the sense that they really thought about both beginners, but also power users. I think this would be the first time that I've really thought that of a Linux distribution, that they're just like, you know, we're going to include things that will be easy and make life easier for all of our users, not just a specific category. Yeah, it's really it's it's a little confusing because when I see the words Linux light, the image that forms in my head is this lightweight stripped down distro, not a lot of apps installed, just, you know, bare minimums, right? Linux light, bare minimums. That's that's what I get in my head. But there's a lot of software, even, you know, all the stuff that you mentioned. Plus, there's a lot of software that's pre-installed. There's uh, GIMP and VLC and LibreOffice and a bunch of other utilities and accessories that, as you mentioned, power users could really take advantage of. I was told you earlier that I was running Pop! OS and... As much as I've loved it, one of the things that I had to do when I went in was go in and configure Firefox so that I could actually watch certain videos on sites that I go to for training. Then in this one, that was one of the first things I did. I'm like, okay, how much configuration do I have to have on this to make it work out of the box? And I clicked Firefox, I went to the site, and the videos just loaded. Everything was already installed, which is just confusing to me on something that says it's a light install. Yeah, it it really makes me wonder, uh, you know, I don't know anything about Linux Lite's popularity or usage numbers or anything like that, but it may have, it may actually suffer the same problem that I think XFCE suffers, is it, it doesn't have that first impression that it needs. You know, with XFCE, you get these gray screenshots and it looks like it's from like the early 2000s. And then you have a, a, you know, Linux Lite based on Ubuntu 1804 and so immediately you think, well, is it is it just a stripped down Ubuntu? Why would I want to use this? I was imagining something like Puppy OS. That's really what I was imagining when we first ah, decided that right. we were going to do this challenge. And I'm like, okay, Linux, you know, all right, I, I'm going to have a hard time being able to really get this up and running so that I can work off of it. So that's kind of why I went so many different ways trying to figure out how to install it and how to really provide feedback on it. And I was blown out of the water. I was really wrong with my first impressions on it. And I have to point out something here uh, regarding the appearance. When you go into the customization options, there are like 30 different desktop styles to choose from built in. I was having fun with that, just going down and being like, you know, there's XFCE Winter and XFCE Purple. And I'm like, all right, let's just try all of these. Yeah, there, that was a lot of fun. And I love that I love that they include that many options without having to, you know, get on the internet and download themes and make those tweaks on your own. Well, Elle, I think we better get out of here, but um, we have one more thing to do. What is next? All right, let me get the screen up. Dum 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 dum. I'm gonna cross my fingers. The winner is... Oh, you have to stay tuned to find out what distro they're going to pick next. So the whole idea is they run a rando spinner, it picks a distro, and then they give it a go. Oh. So probably trying some things I would not have tried. Yeah, things you and I were never going to try on the show. Now we get a chance to give them a go. Now I really hope they get Gen 2. (laughs) <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> right out of the gate. <laughs> yeah. Is it is it actually called the Rando Spinner? Because if not, it should be. Well, we should. Yeah. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if I've gotten the name of it from them, but I like the idea. So I think we'll be hearing from them in the future. And if you have any suggestions or feedback, go to linuxunplugged.com slash contact and uh, let us know in there. Let us know what you think. I enjoyed it. I think uh, I was right. I, I was right along with L. I thought it would totally be like a uh, puppy, small, like damn small Linux Based style puppy name, Linux. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that's what I was expecting. That's what I was expecting. Anyways, we have reached the end of our program. And before we get out of here, I wanted to point you to an article that Mr. Bacon has worked on over on the Linux Unplugged website. We'll have a link for this in the show notes as well. But you can also just go to linuxunplugged.com slash articles. And it is some behind-the-scenes photos of our Linux Fest events, including the Friday stream in the studio, which we had a great crowd in the studio. You can see some pictures of Mr. Chase, who's just looking incredible these days. He's lost 140 pounds. I literally did not recognize the man until he opened his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard the voice and was like, oh, it's Chase. That's Chase. Are you yeah. kidding me? Amazing. Look at that group. There's some pictures of Alex in there, Chase working the booth, and of course, some of the rooms, Elle at her talk, uh, Alex at his talk. And uh, some behind-the-scenes photos uh, from the barbecue as well, all up on the website, linuxunplugged.com slash articles, or there'll be a link in the notes wherever you consume those show notes. We usually say the website URL, but then I realize most people listening, they're checking on their phone app. 
That's really where they're looking at the notes is in the phone app because now we have it in the feed because that's how we do now. Yeah, that's right. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for making it into studio. It was uh, great to have you. So here. good to be here, Mumble Room. Thank you guys for making it. And uh, Mr. Bacon, is there any parting words we need to give people before we get out of here? Like a, maybe a plug for the Friday stream or something? Yeah, yeah Friday. Friday coming stream. Up, uh, Friday's coming up. It's coming up. Um, we're gonna be doing yeah. that, and we're we're gonna be uh, going through some of our travel ventures yes. back home. Yes. Uh, I encourage anyone that was there to show up and maybe share some of your yeah adventures I there or unreasonably around for the Friday stream. Yeah, people can jump in, oh, mumble, yeah. share their stories. That'd be good. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, the Friday stream's a great chance to meet the crew, cover a few stories, wrap up a few things here and there. Guess what? We do it on Fridays. JBLive.tv, JupiterBroadcasting.com slash calendar for that and this show when they're live. And uh, LinuxUnplugged.com for links, subscriptions, all of that. And I hope to see you right back here next Tuesday! Get it out of here. It's for people who like to mess with computers. I do like to mess with computers. Thank you. Episode 300 next. Oh, boy. Ooh. I add that thing to the mix I hadn't expected there. Yeah. I remember 300 of last, and that was a big deal. Yeah. Stop yeah, that, it, you. Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, it's not the first time he's got to 300, so he's so just it's, like... It's getting um, less of a big deal. <laughs> whatever. It's like the third or fourth time I've gotten to 300 at uh-huh. least. You so. blink and just sort of <laughs> burp out 300 podcasts. I'm like, uh, come at me when I get to 1,000, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Burping out podcasts. Uh, Burp. <laughs> there's another one. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, wow. Alex, next year we're going to have to uh, race uh, our little Tiny Hawks, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, man. Ooh, oh, definitely. Jeff, 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 yes. Is that what they're called, Tiny Hawks? Yeah, the model uh, is. That specific model is, I'm going to yeah. have to buy some. I mean, this, these just seem aggressive. I know. So I warn you now, a drug habit will be cheaper than FPV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so the drones themselves are $150 or so. Okay. Um, then you need the batteries, which can be 10 to 20 bucks a pop. Mm-hmm. And they have a flight time of two to three minutes. So you need five or 10 of them. Jeez. To have any kind of, you know, Jeff had three, for example, and he had lots of downtime in between, yeah, yeah. Um, which can be annoying. Um, and then you need the radio, which is two hundred dollars, and then you need the goggles, which can be two to five hundred dollars. So you it's know, it's a proper hobby. Then yeah. you need mm-hmm. to you need to set aside at least a thousand to get into it, and then you're going to want another quad for when the first one breaks. Sure, of course, or so, some dog gets it. Well, the right. uh, the Emacs Sunny Hawk has a little bundle. It's uh, right around two hundred bucks. Comes with everything, but it's not uh, not a hobby grade radio, not hobby grade goggles, yeah. but it'll get you started. Okay, I think I probably uh, I won't say I spent. More money than I told my wife I spent. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been there. Not, <laughs> okay. <That's right>. Wow. <laughs> Rounding um, up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, every every time. But uh, yeah. It, so there's the little tiny ones like Jeff had, but then there's also the five-inch racing drones, which you can build yourself um, out of components from China. Mm. And and that's, for me, I learned a lot of my electronic skills through doing that. Um, when you plug Same a 12-volt thing into a 5-volt thing and it goes bang, and it lets out the magic smoke, it stops working. Yeah. <laughs> A good that is a good that is a good way to learn if maybe just a little bit expensive but uh, a point which you made very well in your talk was that's why in your travels you have found components that you can assemble that you are willing to have blow up on you so that way instead of losing a sixty dollar part you're losing a six dollar part correct yes so the most expensive component on a on FPV drone is probably at most thirty dollars each. You know, each each motor is about twenty. Yeah. The flight control is probably the most expensive bit, around thirty or forty dollars at most. Hmm. So if any if any single component goes bang, then it's not that annoying. If you fly your drone off into a lake, then you've lost three four hundred dollars, and that that is annoying. <laughs> it's like what Alex always says. I mean, this is he's famous for saying this. Uh, if you can think it, you can do it. Yeah. You just have to know how. <laughs>